to welcome to the floor Robbie Gillen, who organises the Brandalism Project, which brings together artists and activists to confront the advertising industry in public space through through billboards and advertising space. Uh, Robbie's been active part of the climate justice movement since 2006, working with Reclaim the Power in support of frontline communities uh, facing fracking, open cast coal mines, and airport expansion, which we already engage with. And more recently, he's, co -found, he's founded the Adblock Bristol Initiative to end out outdoor advertising in the city of Bristol. Some materials at high run. Hi, hi. Hi. Um, could you get a sense of booze in the room briefly? Just me. Uh, if, <laughs> if you're from like the Bath area, could you stick your hand up? And if you're like uh, a member of the academic community at, at Bath University, okay, so that. And then from the southwest of Bristol more generally, Okay, so yeah, that seems like the majority of the room. Sorry for anyone who's not in the knowledge there. Just wanted to <laughs> see. Right. And I'm going to stand here. I'm going to stand here. So, hi, um, my name is Robbie Gillett. I'm, I live in Bristol. Um, and I've been involved in campaigns, as Ben has mentioned. Um, but the thing I wanted to focus on in this 20 minute session today uh, is, is advertising and corporate advertising that's become so dominant and pervasive in, in our cultures. And that it's just seemed very uh, sort of commonplace and everyday. Um, but, uh, I'm from a collective called Brandalism, and in, we started in 2012 with an ambition to put into practice this um, subvertising concept, this, this, this concept of subverting advertising um, that, in some respects, is as old as advertising itself, um, but was popularised, I think from the 90s onwards with the Adbusters movement, but there's a, there's a stronger history before it uh, as well. So we were concerned with spaces like these big billboards that we see all over the city, uh, all over our parts cities in, in Europe and around the world. These ones are 20 foot by 10 foot tall, large canvases as we would come to see them, uh, where we could put up our own artworks instead of, in, in place of that corporate advertising, um, to both critique the advertising industry itself and its question its legitimacy and its dominance in our public spaces, um, but also to talk about the, the impacts of, of consumer messaging dominating our public spaces. So whether that's impacts on our, our sense of body image and gender relations or pollution and plastics and emissions rising or ecological collapse or um, impacts on local economies and the dominance of big businesses and their brands over, over the top of us. So we wanted to use kind of guerrilla arts tactics um, based in a tradition of direct action, which involves not asking for permission from something uh, to, to critique the industry. So we would typically um, simulate the practices of the advertising industry itself uh, we would put on their, their overalls and, and go out in broad daylight. <laughs> we tend to avoid going out in the dead of night with a, with a hoodie up um, and rather just be there in broad daylight with a, the invisibility cloak that is the high-vis jacket. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing what you can do in, in a visit in a high-vis jacket. People come up to you and ask for directions. People yeah, like yeah. ask you from, from the council why we collect their bins and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we were concerned with um, billboards because they, they were big. So we, in, in 2012, did a project in five UK cities. We did a call out to artists to send in um, artworks to respond to a brief that was printed up. The crew went around Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, London, during the, uh, and Bristol during the 2012 Olympics, uh, and we put it up. So. Uh, I'm jumping ahead. We also wanted to deal with bus stop spaces as another form, and um, they are everywhere. They're four foot wide by six foot tall, um, and they require a little bit less kit to access. Um, but I've also got some. It turns out that uh, thanks to maybe the wonders of globalisation, um, the the types of tools you need to access bus stops are very similar 
um, certainly across Europe where we've been operating. Uh, and I pass around these packs um, that uh, we distribute. These are uh, tool packs for getting into uh, outdoor advertising bus stop spaces. So I'll pass them around. Um, you can send them back to the front or, or you can buy them for, for five pounds if you've if, if you got it. Um, so we wanted to... Um, yeah, so we wanted to, through the practice of this and um, this guerrilla, guerrilla art brandalism, or what, however you'll call it, I wanted to look at some of the issues around, around consumerism, around capitalism. So this is a piece by Paul Insect, um, looking at issues of consumerism. Uh, this was a project we did in 2014. Um, again, this is Paul Insect, uh, trying to sort of put into advertising spaces where we're so used to seeing co commercial and consumer messages and start to actually say, well, what are the impacts of those consumer messages? What about well, this lifestyle of consumerism that we all enjoy to differing degrees? Uh, what are the impacts of those? Uh, and, and what are the global implications of those? Um, and as this event is, is focused on the environment, uh, we also wanted to like, critique some of the big industries that are using uh, big advertising spaces. So I'm going to skip ahead and come back to some of those images. So some of my slides are out of order. Um, in 2015, it was the COP21 um, in Paris, the United Nations Climate Talk. Um, and we've been doing bus stop and, and billboard takeovers and interventions for a while and had this, this history in the climate justice movement and, and the direct action cultures. So we went to Paris and met with some of the French crews that have been doing this for uh, a long time. The French anti-advertising movement is actually far more uh, mature and advanced. It's been going 20, 30 years. There are groups all across different towns and cities in France. Um, so we went and met some of these um, Parisian crews that are going out and, and changing adverts for fun and for political, as a political intervention. We teamed up with them, we put out a brief saying it's the COP21, it's the United Nations Climate Talks, we're seeing a lot of big business, a lot of big polluters sponsoring that kind of talk. We've been to some of these cops before, we've got huge reservations and critiques about how it's going to go. Uh, and about 150 different artworks were submitted, um, and 600 of these posters were printed up. Um, and, and we trained about 40 different teams to go out over a couple of days um, during just before the start of the COP negotiations, and some of these artworks went up. And we wanted to take aim at some of the big sponsors, uh, like Air France, uh, big airline, like Angie, big French energy company, with huge investments in, in fossil fuel infrastructure and ownership. Um, uh, and artists responded in various ways. This is like back in 2015, so artists built posters, took a shot at George Osborne, who I'm sure we're all very glad to see the back of, but he was particularly strong fossil fuel ideologue in the Tory party. So here's David Cameron with all his corporate sponsorship, uh, kind of dressed up as a sort of racing car driver. Here's Shinzo Abe for the uh, Japanese premiere uh, with like, uh, Fukushima in mind. Uh, mm -hmm. And other artists responded quite quickly to, to, to the, the state of emergency that was in, in place following the uh, attacks in Paris and how the, uh, the protests were banned um, the, the ones that have been conceived of first. So I'm just going to try and put on a quick bit. I'll, I'll skim through some of these images uh, quite quickly. Divestment groups called out sponsorship of big art galleries and pollutions and practices, so like that. So I'll just jump to this video. If we can, uh, we can do it. Oh,
Um, it's a bit of going to the next one. This is the advert. Yeah. yeah, we started to get um, we started to get ads on our on our YouTube video. <laughs> So yeah, I sort of oh, oops, oops, um, uh, what we wanted to do was um, I suppose kind of skipped over um, our original advertising as being like an integral part of um, of, of neoliberal capitalism over the last 30 years in particular, um, we've seen sort of hyper-consumerist model pushed since the 80s, and uh, lots of brilliant and creative minds are put to use and employed every day, as someone was mentioning earlier, uh, in selling us more and more and more stuff. And so we wanted to sort of hone in on that, on that issue um, through this practice. Um, yeah, I'll just skip through a few times. So... Um, so we've been doing uh, takeovers for a while and getting some traction, um, but we also wanted to question the, the rights of advertisers and, and those who can afford corporate outdoor advertising spaces to dominate our public spaces. Um, so we produced this uh, guide in a kind of TF, Transport for London style, of how to access these bus stop spaces, and we started to put together uh, guides and manuals to, of how to do, to do this, so that, to open up and democratise the tactic of, of uh, reappropriating ad spaces, corporate ad spaces. So lots of different groups could use them, and it wasn't just held within an artist sort of activist community. Uh, so we produced these um, guides, we also installed these guys in the public spaces, so that uh, people would know how they did. Um, and like I say, the keys are, it's not right, but the keys are, are very similar the world over, so we've been distributing these packs uh, and producing little books like this. This one's called um, The Subvertising Street Art Takeover Manual, uh, and this other book's called Advertising Shits in Your Head, uh, and it, it delves into some of the critiques and practices there. Um, so, I think there's this practice, this tactic has been used on the one hand to critique the advertising industry itself and to question its legitimacy and authority. Uh, and on the other hand, to it's been used by lots, of, it's now being used over the last three or four, three or four years, thanks to groups like special patrol groups in London, uh, Brandalism and others elsewhere. It's being used by groups to talk about the issues that they, that don't get airtime, that they want to talk about, that don't get airtime, certainly not on um, corporate advertising spaces, but, um, or, or maybe on the news as well. And so people are using the subvertising takeover tactic, maybe not to critique the industry itself, but just to talk about their own issues. So uh, we worked with uh, a group of um, a community of colour in Brixton, young people, uh, who could put together a series of film posters, 16-year-old, uh, 17-year-old young people, um, put together a series of film posters and, and sort of change them, as you can see, uh, to, to talk about the, the lack of black representation in, in, in popular films, in mainstream films. So we produced a series of things like this, like The Inbetweeners, you've got The Titanic, Bridget uh, Jones' Diary, uh, and lots of others. So they're just using this in, as a, an example of how the tactic can be used to, to get airtime to talk about other issues. Um, groups like Special Patrol Group have directly attacked the Metropolitan Police for being uh, institutionally racist and putting up sort of spoof metropolitan police posters uh, and you know, Palestine solidarity groups uh, you know, across the, the spectrum and I should probably say you know, it's open to the, the right wing groups to use as well it's just a tactic and like any other tactic um, it can be used by different, different political forces um, uh, so legally back you know, they used the tactic they came up as their artistic conception uh, other crews did the installation and they, they found themselves on, on BBC Morning News uh, uh, on, on prime time on Saturday morning discussing 
the lack of black representation in film. So it's like, this is a tactic that uh, can be used by lots of different groups. Um, but it's an arts practice, it's guerrilla art. Um, we were finding that we do these interventions, if they were well, maybe we get a big bit of like media here, we get a bit of talking points in, on social media, a bit of buzz, and then maybe the, the waters will clo close over, life will go on, ads get taken down, maybe they last two weeks if you're lucky, maybe the industry would send out some bands and take them down within one day, especially if you've got a lot of media around it. So we moved to Bristol uh, and we, we wanted to start a campaign that would not just use arts tactics, but um, try to remove the amount of spaces available for advertisers to push their, their messages on us. Um, so we started to do, so we formed this uh, Adblock Bristol group um, to try and make Bristol the first ad-free city in the UK, um, following in the footsteps of Grenoble in France, which is the first European city to remove uh, outdoor advertising, which has been in, from 2015 onwards. Um, so typically, uh, skip over this. Typically, we organise with residents to oppose planning applications for new billboards. Um, the industry is going hard in for digital screens, like this one. You can see this is a, a, a mock up, an artist's impression of a proposed new screen in Easton, um, near where I live. Uh, and so, some of the work that Abbott Bristol is doing is, is both stopping planning applications from the new screens like this. Uh, and also campaigning to get the existing ones taken down. Um, this screen has a so this this image is, is a fake, not fake, but you know whatever it is, um, impression. Um, and we took this image from the planning application from JC Deco, the company itself. And I was like, oh, what's the what's the product on their sample advert? And it's a Lexus. And I was like, oh, how much is that Lexus cost? So I googled it. It's a seventy-six thousand pound Lexus. Uh, <laughs> which might just be a, like, just one example of, a random example that they put into their, their planning application, but for me it was quite a pertinent point. It's like, what are the lifestyles and consumer aspirations that advertisers are pushing onto us? This is a £76,000 car. Uh, this billboard was proposed to go up in Eastern, uh, one of the more economically deprived mm -hmm. areas in the city of Bristol, and Eastern and Lawrence Hill have the highest incidence of air pollution in, in, in the city as well. It's like, hold on, you want to put this huge new digital screen up to push products like uh, flashing new cars that none of us in that neighborhood can really afford. It's, not, it's just like the sort of interconnected madness of it uh, really started to sit home. Anyway, residents objected, about 160 objections went in, the company pulled this application and it did go ahead. Over the last two years, we've stopped 11 of these screens from going up in the city. It's not the most uh, it's like glamorous or exciting work getting people to respond to planning objections, but it's, for us it's like holding the line. It's like holding the sign so you're not taking any more of our visual space uh, and we're campaigning to get other ones taken down. So I'm just going to jump ahead. So these, these are some like quick before and after shots of um, Bristol already had a tradition of taking down buildings in the city. Uh, this is St. Werberg's before and after. There's a, a great two this in church that became visible. Um, bit of a fuzzy picture that one, but it's a quick before and after. This one they tried to turn into a digital screen and we objected to it and it turns out that the original one didn't have planning permission in the first place, so we got that one taken down. <laughs> that's the city centre of Bristol. And again, there's a car advert on there. The car at the motor industry is the seventh biggest sector using outdoor advertising uh, in the UK because billboards are largely aimed at motorists. Um, and some billboard companies will even brag about the levels of congestion and traffic jams in the city because then they've got a captive audience and they'll be like, hey, come and advertise here. There's loads of people stuck in traffic jams. Um, so come and advertise them. Anyway, here's Hot Wells, here's McDonald's, um, and again, a car advert, and this is afterwards. This is like a, a mural. Um, and we wanted to dwell on this just to show that, well, if we don't have loads of corporate advertising in our streets, what else could we do? Could, uh, Bristol has a huge street art and graffiti tradition, and we wanted to build on that. So I'm just going to zoom back. Sorry that my slides are out of order. One of the other projects we run in uh, a neighborhood called St. Webbers is there was a there was a dormant billboard, um, and I've got one minute. There's a dormant billboard, and we have 
rented that build, it's only 600 quid to rent for the year, and we run a series of community artworks on it every year to talk to celebrate things in the neighbourhood, uh, and to talk about the things that advertisers don't talk about. So this, this artwork uh, references a community campaign to get it taken down. This artwork was produced with a children's group at St. Weber City Farm to celebrate nature, uh, and this artwork um, by Lucas Antic celebrates the bicycle because um, you never see any adverts for bikes, <laughs> you see loads of adverts for car culture. So, um, I'll just zoom ahead uh, to a final intervention that is brewing. Uh, and it comes back to this issue, oh no, my slides aren't there. Uh, it comes back to an issue of um, all this creative talent, this artistic genius going uh, and ha uh, being put to work in Massive uh, advertising agencies, uh, and in 2016, we did an intervention where we, we I haven't got the slides unfortunately, but um, we had you know, migrants drowning in the Mediterranean, rising climate crisis, housing crisis, pushing people's rents up, like huge social problems, and some of our best brains are like working out how to sell Snickers and new car insurance, and it's like, this is, this is dark, let's try and recruit some of those people to come over to work on more socially useful projects. So we put up a load of recruitment posters in bus stops outside advertising agency offices in London, Bristol and Manchester and called people into a meeting um, and had a meeting with them, tried to talk to them about whether they wanted to like switch sides. So it's been, but actually what they needed, it turned out, was just some space as advertisers to work through their shit, to like work out what it is, what they're doing um, and sort of reckon with some of those existential problems because not all people in advertising have come to that conclusion. My final point um, is that recently Extinction Rebellion, I shared the concerns that have been raised about them today, uh, one of the many interventions recently is to write to the heads and executives of lots of advertising industries and say, hey guys, there's a climate crisis on if you haven't noticed, and you guys are uh, a big part of that because you've been peddling and pushing the consumerist model and telling us to buy things uh, we, we really don't need it at the time or, or didn't want them to be told us to work. Um, so actually next Tuesday or soon in June industry meet, industry advertising industry executives are meeting to to look at to reckon with this a little bit uh, and to have a themselves about how the advertising industry can use their highly sophisticated often manipulative but very uh, effective communication tools for better good and so that's like a recent development in the advertising industry itself. Uh, but I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. That was very inspiring.